Welcome back, everybody. This is John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. Today's special guest is a pharmacist, actually. Brian Ascenter, he's a graduate of Northeastern University, a pharmacist and dispensary manager in Connecticut. Brian is also the owner of MM Consult in Connecticut, where he counsels patients on the effects and side effects of medical cannabis, possible interactions, which we'll discuss uh, with other medications and consultants, and he's a consultant for businesses. Uh, Brian has also been a strong advocating voice for medical cannabis patients, uh, and as well as equality in the medical cannabis industry. So Brian, welcome, how are you doing today? Doing very well, John, thank you very much. How about yourself? We met, uh, what year are we? 2020. With this COVID, I think we're all just a little, little wacky here. But we met yeah. probably about three years ago in, at, uh, in New Jersey at um, uh, Mary Lynn Mathery's uh, Patients at a Time conference. And so uh, mm -hmm. thanks for being on. Uh, you're out of Connecticut. You're a pharmacist. This is a topic that comes up. And Crit and I were big advocates for pharmacist, pharmacists being involved here in the state of California since, I want to say, about 2013. And so... Um, can you talk about um, how you got into this role? Because you work for a, a big brand chain, Walgreens, for a few years. Can you talk about the mindset of being in pharmacy school? Did they ever discuss Schedule One cannabis or Schedule One drugs uh, like cannabis? And did you ever think that you'd be in the business dis dispensing um, after after uh, uh, being in in the in the block uh, block, block stores uh, like Walgreens? Yeah, well, th John, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I, I think this is a great topic to talk about. And I think that um, pharmacists in this industry are, are integral parts. Um, you know, for myself, I, I spent 16 years with Walgreens working in retail pharmacy. Um, you know, I, I, as, as most pharmacists do, you, you go to school thinking that you're going to help patients, you're going to improve their quality of life and, you know, make sure they're taking the right medications at the right doses and everything. Um, and as many people can, can respect and understand their experiences at a retail pharmacy are a little bit different than that. Um, and, and that's where I think a lot of retail pharmacists have gotten just disenfranchised with it. You spend more of your time arguing with doctors and, and, farm, and uh, insurance companies, pardon me, with about what's covered, what isn't, and why. Then, you know, you have patients that are upset about why it costs so much, why it's taking so long. You're hearing from, you know, your, your corporate bosses so that you're losing hours and expecting to do more. Um, and, and those patients that do have questions that you're there to, to help, to, you know, help guide with their, their concerns, their side effects, you don't have the time to have that conversation with them. And after a process like that, they're probably not that interested in hearing what you have to say anyway with all the frustration and everything. So it really got away from helping patients and, and really having that be the, the goal of the process. And when they started the medical marijuana program in Connecticut, um, you know, for me, I, I, was, I was pretty excited. I mean, they, they never taught us anything about it in college other than, you know, whatever recreational usage you might have had. Um, you know, there, I believe there was some discussion in our toxicology class, which I find rather amusing at this point and ironic, but um, you know, there, there wasn't any discussion of the endocannabinoid system or, or any of those kind of things. And, um, you know, my desire to leave pharmacy and have actual patient contact and, and outcome effect was my biggest driver more so than my knowledge of the endocannabinoid system or anything like that. Um, and, and when I got involved in the dispensary, I just absolutely fell in love. I got goosebumps on a daily basis, still do. Uh, and that's why we do it. I, I have actual direct effect on the patient's quality of life, their outcomes. Um, you know, you, you see patients coming back to us with, you know, without a, a wheelchair or a walker or a cane and, and you know, tears and high fives and, and laughs and, and everything that is, those are just feelings you can't get anywhere else. And that's, that's the reason we went to school is, is to help those patients. So. You know, isn't it a humbling feeling when you do see people having success with this? Because it's not for everybody. And I share this all the time that it's not for everyone. It's not the golden pill, the golden ticket, you know, cure all. I never use the word cure. Um, but when you do see people that have had this stigma and the wall up their whole lives about cannabis bad, a pill is good, you know, meaning you know, just taking, going to the pharmacy and getting this and then realizing, oh my gosh, you know, I've been educated and, and doing these shows and thanks for coming on. I was talking about it like being a throwing a pebble in the pond and the ripple effects of education, education, education. And you saying, you know, hopefully 
they were talking about having pharmacists involved here in California, like they do uh, uh, in the East Coast. You know, having a pharmacist on staff, I think, at the dispensary is is very important. Um, is that still a requirement? Because I know a couple of states out your way that was one of the written in laws and then they pulled that back and then they were open, able to open without a pharmacy on, on staff. Is that what's happening in, in Connecticut right now? Um, that a pharmacist has to be involved to more, uh, I guess, legitimize um, uh, the business out there. And again, it, cause cannabis is not a one size fits all. You know, I would look at age, weight, current health condition, the type of ailment, sensitivity, but also more importantly is the drug to drug interaction. There are drug to drug interactions. And can you talk about that? What you, what you, uh, I mean, I like a daily intake. Do you, are you the person they see first when they come into your, into your locations? Yeah, you know, uh, some great questions. And I think the, the, one of the things you said first is one of the most important points is, is cannabis is not for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, and I think people need to understand that just because we're, we're advocating for cannabis and discussing cannabis use and how it can be safe still does not mean that it's appropriate for every single patient that's out there. And that is not what we're looking to do with any of this. This is simply an option for patients that feel they, they may not be getting what they need and, and there might be a possibility that this could help them as well. Um, so for, for us on the dispensary side of things, you know, the, the patients, they go and they get certified with one of the, the 38 conditions we have in Connecticut now, um, which is getting kind of ridiculous as well. We just got chronic pain added, which was huge, huge addition that yeah. we got finally. Um, but, you know, they see the doctor, they pay the state. Um, and at that point, they, they make a, an appointment at the dispensary that they choose. So when they make that appointment, we have them filling out intake paperwork, just the same as you would going to a doctor's office, you know your contact information for emergency contacts, your um, condition that you're certified for, your other medications, what type of symptoms and ailments are you looking for relief of? Um, you know, so we really try to, you know, and we also want to get their tolerance level. Have they used cannabis in the past? To what level? Have, that is such a huge, huge aspect of it. Um, and, and a part that they're a little hesitant to talk about as well. But um, one of the ways they did it in Connecticut, too, is they descheduled cannabis to a Schedule 2 in Connecticut. So that really makes it easy for the pharmacist to be able to discuss all of this with our patients and the doctors to not be completely, um, you know, not that they aren't anyway, but many of them are not as freaked out that they're going to lose their license and their DEA and this and that, too. By making it a Schedule 2, Connecticut is the one that, that distributes all of the doctor licenses and the pharmacist licenses, so they don't have to worry themselves about doing anything illegal that way. So it makes it much more comfortable for, our, for the professionals being involved. We don't have to worry about losing a license in the process or of having that discussion as well. Um, I, I did not know it, that it was a Schedule 2. Is that, are you the only state in the nation that has descheduled to a Schedule 2? I mean, that's... I, I want to say yes, but I'm not 100% sure on that. I, I'm, I'm not positive. I believe we may be yeah, uh, one of I very mean, few if, if, if it's oh, not. Well, I mean, this us. is the first, the first that I've heard of. I mean, I, I, I want to talk about Epidiolex and the Schedule 5, but I had right. not. And so can you talk about for our listeners what these schedules are, and what, what they mean, and where cannabis currently is now in yeah. the other states besides Connecticut? Absolutely. So um, federally, cannabis is a Schedule One substance, which means that it, it has, um, you know, no medicinal value whatsoever, um, and that it's it's highly addictive and and has significant side effects, which we all know to not be the case. And that's yeah. just a matter of getting the the right research done by the right people, I guess, for the government to accept that. Different conversation for a different day. Um, but the Schedule II medications, it lands uh, in the same group with your, your Percocets, your Oxycontin, um, you know, those type of medications that are highly addictive, do have medicinal purposes to them, uh, um, but they need to be controlled because of potential side effects and everything else. Um, so that does make it legal for physicians to certify patients because we can't prescribe because prescribe is defined federally so they cannot prescribe medical marijuana until that is descheduled federally um but so now for now they have to certify patients um but being that it you, is you, guys, you call it certifying patients because out here we call it rec rec recommendations we can't say prescri pre prescription or prescribing we can say rec recommending 
Yeah, and, in Connecticut, they, they use certification was the definition that, that they put in our regulations. Uh -huh. um, so it's, you know, you get a certification, there's not an actual written prescription for it or anything. Um, and it's only within the, the Connecticut system that it actually occurs. So, um, you know, it, it makes it really good as far as that's concerned. But one of the biggest um, aspects for the clinicians, especially because it's a schedule two, it shows up on their prescription monitoring uh, profile as well. So along with all of their other, you know, Xanax and Oxycontin and Vicodin and, you know, benzos and everything else, if a doctor logs in to see, oh, what's my patient taking, they will see, and we'll get into this in a minute too, a lot of random names they've never seen before, but it, some of them will say medical marijuana. It does list their medical marijuana card as one of the prescriptions that are on there something that they've received. So any doctor in the state of Connecticut can see that they've been using cannabis as well um, as part of their therapy. So that's, that's one of the big ways that, that the clinicians can be a little more comfortable because they don't have to worry just that the patient is disclosing the information honestly. Is that affecting a lot? Because I work with a lot of pain groups outside of the cannabis industry, um, out, out your way actually. And a lot of these pain patients are forced to take drug tests to get, uh, obtain a prescription for um, uh, pain meds. And if they, see, if they have cannabis in their system, they're declined. And so is this a, you know, does that, does that uh, affect a lot of patients? Yes, it, it has. We're seeing them, it kind of turn a little bit the other direction now though, okay. um, for a couple of reasons. So yes, there, there were, we had patients coming to us constantly saying, I tested positive at my pain management clinic. They're discharging me. We need to, you know, do you know any pain management doctors? And, yeah. you know, I mean, we had relationships with a couple of them who we knew were seeing patients and we were okay with it. They got very quickly overwhelmed with all of the patients that were being discharged from all of these other locations. Fast forward about two years when Connecticut, uh, along with the rest of the country in the opiate epidemic, decrease the total number of pills that could be prescribed to any one patient for opiates, benzos, muscle relaxers. So now by default, these same pain management clinics are having to certify their patients because these patients need something. They've had them uh, you know, consistently on unbelievable dosages of opiates that, that are completely outside of, of guidelines and everything else. And they need, they just had to cut them off cold Turkey because they weren't allowed to prescribe anymore. Well, at that point, these patients, what are their two options? Well, I can go get it somewhere else or maybe enough. we can, yeah, they end up on the black market, which typically means heroin because it's a lot cheaper than what your opiates are, or your pills are on the black market. Or we can certify them for medical marijuana and we can try to help that be a, a bit of a softer landing for them. So they became a little bit more accepting. Um, now that we just passed chronic pain, we're, we're really fingers crossed. That's a game changer for us, for yeah. them. That they originally you guys, it. you came out of the gate with about 11, 12 uh, qualifying conditions. Yep. Um, and now, you know, cause we work with a lot of Connecticut patients and they'd say, yeah, I don't, I have pain, but it's not on here, you yep. know, and, and that's tough. And there were other states that didn't have cancer on there, but they had pain. And so the doctors are writing, recommend you're, you have pain with cancer. Yes. Okay. This is what I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put that on your record. And so again, like you said, turn the blind eye, the, you know, the gray zone um, with that. And so now you said there are 34, how many, how many qualifying conditions? 38. But don't qualifying conditions, and I, yeah. we have 10 pediatric, so 10, 18, and under that, that qualify as well. Yeah. Um, but that was kind of the bit of the headache for us as well, because the we have to do everything through our legislative process. We don't yes. have any ballot measures or anything like that. So even adding conditions to our, our program has to go through a, a legislative review board to get added on, which is just a headache. In, in that process, though, they built in this board of physicians that are some very esteemed doctors from Yale University and others around the area um, that we have to present these, these conditions to this board who will then decide whether or not they're gonna give their blessing and pass it on with their blessing to the regs review. Are you the pharmacists or are you the patients out there? The patients are the ones that have to do it, but the patients yeah. have to provide these doctors with all of the study information and everything else. 
So a lot of the times it's, it's more, um, you know, patient groups or doctor groups or something that are doing this. But when, when we were actually testifying in front of the legislature at one point to get some of these approved, they had no idea that opiate use disorder and chronic pain were on the list of condition in many other states right around us, let alone across the country. And they're like, no way, that's not true. And I'm like, it's here, it's here, it's here. And they, they were just looking at me like I had seven heads and I'm like, guys, we need to wake <laughs> up. This is, this is happening, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think they started to with the opiate thing, they started realizing patients needed a, a softer landing, at least than than yeah. hitting the streets for heroin and everything else. It's, so we're, we're seeing easier access, I guess. It's tough, you know, Corinne and I have been part of the um, neuropathy groups, we've spoken to neuropathy groups for years, and uh, both with cancer and diabetic neuropathy. And oh, yeah. you know, they were used to taking, you know, four or five oxys a day is like you and I would take a breath mint. And then they said, let's look into cannabis. Cannabis was popping up everywhere. And they would take five milligrams of cannabis uh, mm -hmm. of a capsule or however they took it. And next thing you know, they were climbing the walls. They were so stoned. They said, you know what? Look at cannabis did to me. I'm not going to do this. And it's like, no, it's actually a drug to drug interaction. And there are a lot of doctors that have spoken and pharmacists have spoken that it can intensify uh, a, a pharmaceutical, you know, there, mm -hmm. there was a, uh, one of the cannabis documentaries that had been playing around, um, you know, for the last six, eight, eight years. And they're talking about, and they're interviewing this, this, uh, grower up in the Northern California Humboldt area. And he was talking about all his different, different farm, uh, plants he was making. And he goes, in this plant, this plant's great. If you mix it with a pharmaceutical, it will double the high. And so that's the part that, scares a lot of uh, patients and doctors and medical experts, I think in government, you know, institutions, when they say, okay, what's the reason? Is it, is it for healing or is it for the high? I mean, are we looking at, and I think it's, I think, and I don't want to, I'm not bad mouthing recreation versus medical. I think it's very beneficial. We, you know, uh, I work with a lot of pain patients that need that. Um, it's, you know, the combination and they find, find success with pharmaceuticals. And so can you talk about the benefits of combining, safely combining where say they're taking 50 milligrams on a normal basis and they add cannabis. Now they can take 25 milligrams and get the same, same effect as a 50 milligram um, a pharmaceutical or whatever, wherever they're at. Can you talk about how, how the benefits of safely combining cannabis with a pharmaceutical? Absolutely. And, and I mean, that's, that's probably my, my biggest goal in all of this. And, and what is awesome, you know, because coming from the pharmacy where you find a lot of people that are pill chasing and everything else, part of the, the nature of the beast there. But in, in cannabis, you're finding people that are looking to get off of their pills. They're, they're sick of the side effects. They're sick of, you know, taking a handful of different pills every single day just to be able to get out of bed and function. And they don't feel like they're a human being again, or that they're there physically, mentally. Um, and, and most of that is because of the side effects of the medications. Um, and and as, as a pharmacist, as, as a, you know, a science-based person, I, I very much appreciate what prescription medications can do. They are absolutely necessary to keep people alive in so many situations. Now, you know, do they need to be at doses that they're at consistently? Probably not. Um, is it safe to just go cold turkey because you started medical marijuana? Absolutely not. No. And that's the first thing that I tell my patients because uh, the, the process that we use, and you know, I, I mentioned it before, and, and you kind of did too, five milligrams for one person and five milligrams for another person are two very different doses in the, in the cannabis world, whereas in your pharmaceutical world, they're not considered to be that way. That, that tolerance has a big part of, of how much of an effect that has but it's also what is the outcome the patient's looking for. Um, your question earlier is, you know, is it medicinal or is it recreational? My answer is yes. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think it is. And, and I think that you have two very different factions of, of people that are looking for it for both of those reasons. And we need to respect that as well. Those that are looking for the medicinal end of things that want to get off their prescription medications, aren't looking to be stoned all the time, just want to be, my favorite line is they want to be an active participant in their life, right? That, that's, that's my favorite line out there for patients. So, you know, if, if that's what they want, well, we can give them that. We can decrease their prescription medications, allow them to feel and experience and, and be a part of it. 
allow them to roll around on the floor with their grandkids for an hour or finish a grocery store trip or whatever those simple things happen to be. But, you know, we can do that very slowly and easily and, and how it's comfortable for them too. And by no means do we touch any prescription medications for the first few weeks, maybe months, because I want them to get stable on the cannabis. Then we worry about decreasing medications. I want to know what's working, what isn't, and totally. why, and let's get you stable. Then we can start worrying about decreasing other dosages because we're going to have to play with these dosages as well. So it, it just takes fewer hurdles out of the process that way. And the doctors are typically much more receptive to that process than they are, okay, we're just, we're getting rid of this and we're not doing that and we're only doing this now too, so. Yeah, you know, that's the one thing I always should, again, you know, cannabis helps, like you said, it's very humbling. I mean, I, I got chills talking about this right now, just thinking of all the people that we've met over the years that we've worked at, that we've talked with, you know, uh, senior groups, you know, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times we, we go in there and said, I lost my spouse the first time I made it able to go down to get, to be back in the group with people again, I've used cannabis, cannabis, I've been against cannabis my whole life and I've tried I've tried this and I've had success. Uh, and I would share with them too, is don't, like you said, don't go cold turkey, have a doctor involved, have a pharmacist involved when you're titrating, let your doctors know um, that you are gonna try cannabis, let your family members know if, if you're gonna try cannabis. My friend's a chiropractor and in his office, it says pain is not a way of life. You know, and That's it's awesome. just like, oh, I'm in pain, but this is the way my life is. I'm getting older. No, you know, right. let, let's, let's see what you can do. You can do it naturally. You can do it successfully. You can do it, do it safely. Um, can you share any of your stories? I know you talked about, you know, some of them would come in with wheelchairs and then down the way, uh, uh, you know, they, they're walking and they hug you and they, and they you have know, tears in their eyes. But isn't that a, a great feeling to see when people have success with this? I mean, I've it, seen both sides. Oh, they, goosebumps, like you said, yeah. just thinking about it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can see the patients. I can hear them. I can, you know, I mean, they're, they're caregivers. They're family members that, you know, will tell you that, you know, I, I have my spouse back. I have my, my mom back, my dad, whatever. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, until you, that changes their perspective as well. You know, they may have been against this, but now they're, but, you know, I mean, the, a lot of the times, a lot of the patients that I've noticed um, have been, say, like your MS patients and your Parkinson's patients. Yeah. Um, they, I, I, just because the physical aspect of, of what those diseases can do to these people are, are so visually, I don't want to say stunning, but, you know, they're very strong. Um, and, and those are the patients that, you know, I mean... I would, you know, we have cameras everywhere. So you're always watching who's coming in and going and everything. And when I, you know, you see them coming up in the wheelchair and you're like, oh, Jane Doe's here or whoever, you know, and you're happy to see them or whatever it happens to be. I mean, I, I can think of, of three patients that I saw walking up one time with, with a cane. Uh, with, it was a Parkinson's patient that hadn't been out of her wheelchair in about eight months. And, you know, I mean, was it every day? No, it wasn't. So please don't get it wrong. They ebb and they flow. But to give that to them for yeah. just that day, that week, those couple of hours is, it's priceless, man, to see that, that happiness, that joy on their face, excuse me, the lack of pain that they're going through, those, those simple things. Now, I mean, they're not running a marathon, they're not, you know, but, but you gave them some freedom, some ability to be mm -hmm. a human being again. And, and that is, is so priceless in so many of these situations where patients feel like, they're never going to get back there again. But like you even said, like a grandfather, you know, rolling on the ground with his grandkids, you know, it's like, for sure. I haven't been able to do this for you. You mentioned about, you know, parents and, 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 and kids talking about their parents having success. I've had more calls from buddies of mine from high school that will call me up and say, your mom was at church and talked about cannabis with my mom and my mom called you and we've been trying to get her to use cannabis for years. And of course, they're not going to listen to us. But right. Yeah. You don't listen, listen to your kids. To you. And they're the biggest cannabis advocate now of going, I'm sleeping better. I'm off my medications. I'm able to, you know, drive and, and be a babysitter for my grandkids and stuff like that. So yep. they go, I don't know what you said to my mom, but thanks. You know, it, it, it worked. And sometimes it takes that because, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, like, I don't know. Do you have kids? Yeah, yeah, I do. You know, sometimes I may listen to your to your their uncle more than you know, 
they'll turn to Absolutely. you over, over the mom and dad type of thing. Um, earlier, you're talking about uh, patients and a lot of uh, pain patients that we work with on the East Coast in the pain world, not the cannabis world, that need their medications for, I'll say, fibromyalgia pain. Sometimes mm -hmm. we'll have, because there is a limit of what pharmacists sometimes can fill. I've heard the story saying, the pharmacist will say, no doc, we can't give, you know, Sue, um, you know, these 30 pills, it's too many. Okay, he'll call back in and, and, and <clears throat> do a recommendation, from, a prescription for 29. Right. And they'll go, come on, let's play. He goes, this is my patient needs this. Okay, we're not, this is not some junkie that, that needs it. Um, yeah, I don't say junkie, but I mean, it, you know. It, it, no, it, but that's, that's the mentality. It is, and, and a lot of these patients, they go in there thinking they're, okay, I'm guilty because I need this medication. And the people are going to look at me like, oh, are you just an opioid user? I heard of a, a, a husband that had to drive to another state to obtain his wife's medication. And do you, do you see that? Or do you have reciprocity uh, in, in Connecticut for cannabis patients like they do in Michigan and other states out your way? Uh, Connecticut, no. Rhode Island allows for reciprocity from Connecticut to Rhode Island. Uh, Mass is fully rec. Um, they don't, I, I don't think you, you're, you reciprocate to Mass yet. Yeah. Um, Maine, you reciprocate to New York's a whole different program yeah. itself and everything too. So um, it, we do not accept anybody as we, we like to think we're kind of special in Connecticut and you know, the way and we I, I think program. out your way and I had Michigan, which is a, quite a few states, but I'm talking from California out that way because I know, I know exactly where, where you guys are. I've been there. Um, uh, but I mean, it's so tight, you know, every, yeah. every, of all the, all the states there. Um, let me, let me go into schedule uh, the different schedules again, but also oh. Do you want to talk about the patent in the U.S. government? Does that affect you guys at all? Of how you, you mentioned no medical schedule one, no no medical uh, uh, benefits, and uh, but they have a schedule one, uh, but they have a patent on uh, right. uh, cannabis or CBD as a neuroprotectant with medical benefits. Is this kind of, you know, I'm I'm just I, like I said, I knew nothing. I didn't know you guys were a schedule two, and yeah. so I'm gonna read. I mean, that that just blows my mind, and I would like to get into uh, you being a pharmacist talking about um, uh, pharmaceutical legal, besides Marinol, which is a mm -hmm. synthetic form of THC for cancer patients for nausea. Um, uh, I guess a little pain too, because I know a lot of doctors that uh, will rec prescribe Marinol in states that the it, cannabis is not legal to hopefully help a patient that way. And they're finding that they do have success. But where I'm going with this is going to the schedule five and having epidiolics in there. Do you have any um, uh, experience with epidiolics, or do you do you need it because you're living, you, you work in a in, in a dispensary, and and uh, you know you, you, there's no need for that option, I guess. Um, so I, I have I've had a lot of mixed emotions about epidiolics for a uh -huh. lot of reasons. Um, I, I was I'm very happy that it went through the entire process that it did, and and proved to be effective and safe and everything else. Um, I believe the schedule five listing is, is still too strict. It should be, you know, I mean, it, it should be just as any other prescription. Um, it, it's essentially just CBD, you know, but I love that it is from the plant itself. It's not synthetic. It, it is actual legitimate CBD that they're obtaining. To me, the biggest advantage of the Epidiolex is the consistency. Yeah. Um, and, and that is the biggest disadvantage to the, the cannabis industry in general right now is the lack of consistency. And, you know, we, we talk about, you know, cloning and, and isolates and, and all of these other things that we can do to get that. Um, and, and that takes away a lot of the entourage effect and the whole plant effect, which Epidiolex gives you at least some of that, uh, not to the extent that true whole plant does, but it, yeah. it's much more so than say Marinol, um, you know, and, and some mm -hmm. other options that we have. Um, you know, so I, I really think that especially for kids, having that consistency in the dosing and knowing what you're going to get every single time, knowing the strain, knowing everything, yeah. that is, is so important. The, the, each chemovar, each strain can express itself very differently from one batch to the next, from, you know, your, your strain, the, you get 
let's just say Blue Dream, for instance, yeah. uh, in California, and you get it in Massachusetts, and it might be from the same seed company, but you're going to get two very different phenotypes, even if they're grown indoors and everything else. There's, it's just, it's Mother Nature has its way of doing that. Um, GW with Epidiolex has, has found a way to, to do it consistently, and, and I am very impressed with that. Yeah. Um, and that's probably my, the biggest thing I always talk to our patients about is that, you know, the, the biggest headache is the constant, you know, trial and error that you're going through the constant changing of strains because of availability or the potency of this tincture versus that tincture, which is the same strain, but it's a new batch. So it's more mm. potent, less potent, different CBD ratios or whatever too. Epidiotics gives you that consistency. So doctors can be much more comfortable with it as well. Yeah. And I hope I, and I share, and I'm, and I'm not a big fan of sh uh, strain names because if I, like you said, if I grew blue dream out here and you had the same seed, I sent it out to you and you grew it, it would be completely different from the way I grew the pH and the water, the, the heat, the right. temperature, um, et cetera. And so when I hear patients say, Oh, I, I need to get this you know, it's not consistent. It's not, uh, which you do. The one thing about Epidiolex that, um, uh, and a dear friend of mine, she's 19 and she's tried all the different cannabis products and she has autistic, she's autistic, but graduate high school works, you know, functioning autistic and their neurologists out here said, okay, you know, actually they went to the neurologist said, if, if you're not crazy about us using all these different cannabis products, then write a prescription for me for uh, Epidiolex. And I was so anti, you know, Epidiolex coming in here. And with my own eyes, I've seen success with her, with her. The one thing that they're not crazy about is it the strawberry taste, the flavoring, like it's a, right. like it's a candy. And, and so they've written to Epidiolex and spoken to Epidiolex. Like, what was, the, what was the purpose of this? And I think it was more just to disguise the taste, but not everybody wants to have that sweet strawberry taste in there either too. And I always share with patients, Mix it with applesauce in, you know, if you don't like, right. if you don't like the taste. <clears throat> so anyway, that's on that, that side. Let's talk about you and what you're doing and how, uh, what you, what really brought you into, are you a patient? And I don't mean to, to, to go into any personal, so you don't have to answer that, but what brought you into this? Did you see something in your life? Like Corinne and I, cannabis was not our lifestyle. And I don't want to say we were forced into us, but we were, we kind of, um, her father was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, metastasized to his brain. We knew nothing about cannabis, knew about it in high school and college, uh, but just not the medical benefits of this. And he was given two weeks to live. Uh, we came across a study that showed 40% of cancer patients pass a malnutrition before cancer takes over the body, wasting mm -hmm. syndrome, just like with AIDS patients. And so I wheeled him into his oncologist office and make a long story short, he was on 24 seven oxygen. And we asked how much time they said, two weeks, weeks um, through tears. I said, what can we do? He said, we can give you morphine. He said, I'm not in any pain. I said, what about, I look at Corinne and this, and she was, I was the boyfriend then. I wasn't the husband then. So it's like, yeah. don't mean to cross any, any boundaries, <laughs> but what about, what about cannabis? And uh, they looked and they said, we'll try anything. And I said, for appetite. And we didn't even know the benefits of the plant then. And right. make a long story short, he's still alive today. That was 2011. And that's why we started United Patients Group for that reason. Uh, because we knew a million other families out there like us. Um, uh, maybe cannabis wasn't their lifestyle and they needed the education and information to come and feel safe. And, you know, so we worked with patients around the world, doctors in medical institutions around the world, government institutions around the world, uh, and just getting the information out. And so that's how we, uh, 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 I guess we're adopted into this industry. And so, um, so I didn't know if, if you had a similar story, but let's talk about, um, again, you know, what your, what your business has led from pharmacy school, working for, you know, Walgreens and now dispensary. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it, it is in college, I experimented as many of us do, you know, and, and um, the, the one way I always talk about cannabis use to, to my patients, especially I am a patient, you know, as well at this point. Um, but one of the ways I always talk about cannabis use is just like anything else, like, like alcohol or, or anything else when you're younger. If a little bit is good, more must be better. You don't know limits. You don't know, you know, you don't really feel consequences because you're invincible at that age anyway. 
Um, so, you know, as you get older, your, your goals change, your, your reason for using it probably changes. The goal isn't to get high, it's to, you know, be able to, you know, go out and have a nice meal with your family or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, but it really changes typically from recreating to medicating. And, you know, it, when you start using it, because we have responsibilities, we have jobs, we have kids, we have, you know, it can't just be an all day, every day, Doritos and Mountain Dew and video games kind of a thing. So, you know, it, it's, that's where I believe we change to medicating. We're using it for sleep, we're using it for pain, we're using it for, you know, a lot of other things. Um, and, and, and that's where that, that recreational medicational line starts. You know, then you start jumping into your, your chronic patients and everything too, which is much more the medical side. But for me, it was about getting out of the pharmacy. I just couldn't do it anymore. I was burnt out. I wanted something new. I wanted patient contact. Um, in this industry, I'm like, this is just awesome. I get to get in an industry on the ground floor and, you know, try to build something up. And uh, I was thrown into the mix. I, I it was in about a, about nine months after the program started, I, I started actually, um, they had lost their manager and I got thrown into a disaster at the time. And for me, I was so excited, but the, the biggest problem I had is, and as many pharmacists you'll meet, we have pretty big egos. <laughs> we like to think we know everything. So, you know, when I have patients that are coming to me, teaching me about this medication that I'm supposed to be explaining to them, that was a huge hit to my ego. I, I didn't, I didn't like that everybody else can tell me more information than I know. And I'm supposed to be the expert in the area here. So I threw myself into it. I, I really just found everything I could to, you know, educate myself. I felt like a 16 year old kid looking at pictures of, of weed all day, every day, wondering if the government was going to be tracking me and everything. But as you get into it, you just, you get so much more information that you're like, it makes me question all of my education in pharmacy school and everything else because I just drank the Kool-Aid, man. I didn't know any better. I didn't know there were other things out there until I started really searching for it. And, you know, I mean, you Google cannabis and, and you're just looking for a whole mess of stuff you're not interested in. But if you have a clue as to what you're looking for or directions or, or a way to determine which is giving you good information, bad information, accurate, inaccurate, whatever, you're able to get to so many, so much more. And I mean, honestly, one of my biggest things was when I met you at Patients at a Time there, I, I have never felt more uneducated in a situation. Like there, there's just so many experts in one area. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, I felt like by being there, I had to learn just by osmosis. There's just so much intelligence and conversations going on around me that I'm like, oh my God, like I never, never knew, never thought, never anything. And it's just, it drives me that much more to know that much more to help my patients that much more and everything too. So. That, that was my first conference that Krenai, a true medical camp, medical cannabis conference that Kren and I attended back in 2011. And we were like that too. We said, Oh my gosh, I cannot believe all the benefits. And, and Mary Lynn, who's actually going to be on this show next week. Awesome. She, uh, you know, it just opened our mind of all the different things because, and it's funny, I'll, I'll go to two things because I, when I, now when I present, and I do a lot of pre presenting outside of the cannabis industry and in international integrative oncology conferences, and, so, and I always have this slide and it's a big roll of duct tape and people like, hey man, you got the wrong slide up there. And I said, you know, I put the slide up there because I don't want to say cannabis is like duct tape with a million and one uses, but when you really get down to it and at this conference, they had all these doctors from around the world and their life studies of talking about cannabis and this certain ailment to certain disease. And I remember my, my father was a diabetic and he was a healthy diabetic, if you can be a healthy diabetic, but he was a healthy diabetic and he, you know, diabetes affects everything and he had not have a heart attack. Um, but he, but I remember listening to this doctor from Italy talking about cannabis and diabetes. And I remember just sitting there and just tears. And I remember looking at Corinne, I said, God, I wonder if I could have done something for my dad, you know? And uh, it's amazing on, like you said, I mean, I, I just sat there and just notes and notes and notes and all the stuff. And I, I mean, I learned so much just from that one conference. And, 
And a lot of my friends in this industry, the first time that they had it ever discovered uh, uh, cannabis and the benefits, and they're nurses in this industry, uh, was going to these events as well. Um, Don Marie Steenstra, I don't know if you know her husband, Eric, uh, he's out there away, but in Maryland. And that was her, Eric took, brought Don to this, and she had this same exact experience. She said, oh my God, I've been a nurse. You know, how come I never learned this type of stuff? Um, let's talk about Connecticut and your program, because it's a pretty special program out there. Can you talk about why, what other states can learn from your program? And I think a lot of these, you know, cannabis has been legal here, medically legal in California since 1996. Right. And so I used to get, <laughs> I used to get this one do doctor from the Department of Health out of New Jersey. He used to call me and he says, hey, you know, I've been put on this because I'm like kind of the black sheep of the Department of Health over here. And so they want me to contact other states that have gone through some, what can you help us do that we're not doing out here? And so I started oh, yeah. talking and sharing with them. And the following year, he calls me up. He goes, hey, me again. You remember? I say, of course. He goes, okay, now that Colorado is recreationally illegal, they want me to fuck up and see what's, what's, what's right and what's wrong and help us here in the state of New Jersey. Because New Jersey was legal for quite some time, but they didn't have access. Right. You know, it's like having, it's like uh, Georgia. We, we did an article on Georgia doing the pretend state because we have a lot of Georgians that call us. Yep, you're legal, but you can't bring it in. You can't grow it and you can't buy it here. It's like having a driver's license. Here, you can drive, Brian, but you can't have a car. You There's know? no cars, right. No <laughs> car. And so can you talk about what Connecticut has seen and done and probably why, um, what you guys are, what you can share with other states that, you know, should I think truly should have a, a pharmacist on board um, to talk about the drug drug interactions? No disrespect to the, the bud tenders. I know a lot of people hate that term, but it's difficult going going in because I have a lot of seniors that will come home and they go, "Oh yeah, this is what I what I purchased," and uh, they gave me a freebie on a, a brownie or a joint. What do I do with this? Or they eat the brownie and they go, "Oh, that was delicious." And then they eat it again because they don't feel anything. And now they're in the ER. And so you do see a lot of that. And so I think that's where the education comes in. We're a role of a, a pharmacist or a, an educated uh, bud tender because you don't know, like you said, with doctors going to the pharmacy, all these different ph products that are in the, in, in the, in the body. And so um, a lot of times you don't know, are they diabetic? Do they need to stay away from sugar? The other day, doctor, my mom said it was frustrating. She, she was, you know, has her girlfriend that she goes for a walk with. And so she says, she was asking about, uh, just does, will gummy bears help with, with arthritis? And I said, well, you don't have arthritis. So what's happening? She, and so she shared about her friend. She goes, she saw it on Dr. Oz did an article about, did a show on, uh, and, on, on gummy bears. And I said, mom, the number one thing that hurts arthritic patients is inflammation, sugar, Right. So this exactly. is the stuff that frustrates me when you have mainstream media. And I'm a fan of Dr. Oz. You know, I was a fan of Dr. Mm -hmm. You know, Gupta back in the day when he was, you know, with you know, headline news uh, before he, he became uh, Gupta in, in the cannabis industry. You know, right. so can you talk about, the, uh, what, sorry, I'm all over the place here, but That's I'd like right. to know about why the, the, your Connecticut um, uh, program really stands out and what other, other states can benefit from, from learning uh, about sex, successful um, programs in other states like like Connecticut, and then I talked about the um, uh, education. You know, talking about don't eat the whole edible. You know, and and what do you do when they when when people come into your location? Absolutely, that, that's one of the first things I tell them is we talk about edibles. Um, yeah. We'll get to that in a second, though. Yeah. So Connecticut's program, um, it, it's one that I'm very proud of. We we have our issues, just like every other program, obviously. Um, but a couple of the things that I really like is we have the strictest testing of anybody anywhere in the country. Um, they, you know, we, with the molds, mildews, heavy metals, pesticides, all that kind of stuff, it is the lowest possible thresholds anywhere in the country to, to test for those. Um, they also require full cannabinoid and terpene profiles and everything on there too, which is great. Um, but the, the big thing that, that we've really been able to do with the producers that we have in Connecticut is really push them to all pure oils for all of their vape oils and everything too. Um, you know, we, we've, there, with all of the issues with the, we never had any vitamin E or anything like that. Um, there, there were some, some peg and stuff that they had used for flavoring for different things and whatnot too. Um, and, you know, 
I have always been one to educate my patients on what exactly they're putting in their body. So, you know, if this is a decision you want, because you need that root berry flavored vape, well then, you know, that's great, good for you, but understand what you're doing for yourself. Um, so, you know, I think that's, we use that as a huge talking point when we're educating our patients is helping them to understand, you know, listen, everything is tested to make sure that you're not getting any of these other, you know, um, unnatural things yeah yeah so um you know and not only that the all of the the edible products we don't have any gummies or, or any candies or anything like that because they're too kid friendly uh, we do have cookies and brownies and is that stuff. a law in connecticut or just in your yeah so no, I was that's a law about in connecticut. What, what products are available because some states say you can have flour other, but you can't have oil other states will say you can have oil but you can't have right. flour so what are what products so you so connecticut does not allow uh, uh, no edible. gummies, no drinks. We, we have um, tablets and capsules. We have cookies. We have brownies. We have baking mix. We have honey. We have all kinds. I mean, you can bake your own whatever the heck you want to bake with the mixes you get. You can make wow. gummies with it and everything too. Yeah. So, you know, we, we tell patients, listen, if you really want gummies, here's some oil, here's some mix, whatever. Here's the, the website to go to to how to do that. But, you know, we don't want to go get the gummy yourself. And to put your oil on it and eat it that that's way. That's exactly what I tried. I'm like, you don't even need to do that. Just take, you know, you can measure out the oil so you know exactly. exactly how much is on every single piece. You put it on the gummy, you eat it. You don't need to make gummies. Now you can actually eat the gummies when you want them. You don't have to worry that those are mommy's gummies only or daddy's gummies only, you know. So those simple little fixes are, are just, you know, beyond easy for patients to do. Um, we do have syringe oils. I mean, we have, we have some full spectrum, some, you know, RSO and stuff. We have, um, you know, some MCT hemp oil oils as well. So they can make their own capsules and stuff with that. Um, we have all of your vape cartridges and everything too. We have flour all over the place there. I mean, it's, we have a pretty wide selection. Um, one of the things that I've been really proud of more recently that we've seen is I've started seeing we have uh, CBN tablets, yeah. which are unbelievable uh, as the patient who needs them for sleep and muscle spasms and stuff. I love them. Can you talk about uh, let me cut you off there. So, so for yeah. our listeners to CBN, what Brian is mentioning, is it just another cannabinoid? And there are, yeah, sorry, the number is. Some people say 120, some people say 160. And so different cannabinoids are, there's, there, I'll say 140, put it right in the middle. Um, yeah. The cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. THC is a cannabinoid, CB, CBD is a cannabinoid, and the CBN, what Brian was mentioning, is also a different type of cannabinoid. And each cannabinoid has their own, uh, I, I guess, benefits. CBN is a great benefit for sleep. And so, um, uh, and again, you don't always have to smoke um, the product you don't have to worry, but companies will extract these different cannabinoids out. And then back to testing, Brian, um, it's not up to you, the patient, to go out and, and get your product and have it tested. Uh, in most states, and I'm assuming in, in Connecticut, it's a regulation to have all products tested. They test for mold, pesticides. Uh, do you test for metals in your state? Yep, heavy metals as well. well. Test state, uh, you know, just to make sure what you're putting in your body is exactly that is on on that on that label. And if a comp if you don't live in Connecticut or California or a state that recommends that or requires it, I should say, uh, always ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, I'd like to see these test results. If they don't have it, go with another product. And if that dispensary does not have it, go to another dispensary. Um, exactly. You know, or go to the company's website. They should have nowadays. Uh, when you have a product, I don't have a box here, but a lot nowadays, it will have the lot and batch number for that product that you're taking. And uh, just technology, you can do a QR code or go to the website and they'll show exactly the, 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 the test results. I would say look for test results about six months old. Uh, I was on with a gentleman the other day and he said actually 12 to 24 months still, depending on how they, how they uh, store it. Um, right. You know, so it's up, up to you. I, you know, I think newer, newer is better. Just like food, it's a vegetable as well. Um, how easy is it for patients to become a pa patient in Connecticut? It, do, is it, do, like out in California, but before this law change, before recreational, you can become a legal patient in one day. And we used to have a lot of out-of-state patients that would come here to obtain their medicine. They go and get a California ID with a, a U.S. passport, yep. um, open up a P.O. box. I mean, to, I mean, when you're battling something as severe as cancer, 
I mean, you're going to do it. And then they can meet with a doctor and then obtain it that, at that day. They can stay out here for two days, two weeks, whatever. How they, if they want to bring it back, it's illegal. So I'm not advising anybody to break the law. But, um, but for a cancer patient, my, my father-in-law, who was given two weeks to live, he was able to get his recommendation that day and get on his routine where I have other, other patients in, in other states that they've been diagnosed and say, well, Brian, you know, you're going to have to wait two weeks and put all this paperwork. Is Connecticut that strict of a state where they won't write a recommendation or what'd you call it again? That's uh, not a script. Certification. Yeah. Certification, excuse me. Um, it, how, how quickly can a patient become certified in your state? Um, well, the process has absolutely improved uh, over the last couple of years. We, we have many more clinics and doctors that are signed on to actually certify patients. So that has significantly improved access for patients. I mean, our program has grown over 20% in the last year just because we have more clinics um, to certify. What One of the biggest things was a uh, year and a half, two years ago now almost, they started allowing APRNs to certify as well. So that really opened up. And, and what is an APRN? Um, uh, nurse practitioner. Oh, nurse practitioner, excuse me, okay. Yep. So they, they, um, they allowed them to start certifying patients as well. So they didn't have to go see just the doctor. And, you know, we had, uh, I mean, Connecticut's a small state, but I think we had like five doctors that were known as the pot docs in Connecticut. How, how many you patients know, do you have out there? Right now we have just about 43,000 patients. Oh. Um, chronic pain just went live, not one month ago tomorrow. Actually. Oh boy, so that, that probably number will double here that, in the next year. We're expecting that to double, triple uh, over yeah. the next year and a half or so. Um, so, you know, that that's a, a big part of, you know, the, the growing pains that we're going to have there. Um, but right now for patients, once they get certified, um, they, once the doctor does it, then they have to pay the state another $100 fee right now, which we're trying to get eliminated, might go through hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but they pay that, then they have to upload their proof of residency. So you have to have like a recent bill or piece of mail or yep. something like that. So that's the one hurdle compared to California we have too. Um, but they, they're only allowed two and a half ounces in a month as well. Okay. So that's that you can lobby for more. Some doctors will put that paperwork in, but you know, if you have a patient on a cancer regimen, that two and a half ounces is not getting it done. Yeah. So, um, can you legally grow out there? No, no grow rights. That's the other thing we've been pushing is if not, not necessarily grow rights, but patient grow rights. You know, yeah. if you're a cancer patient, you should be able to, um, you know, even as part of their study to, to yeah. see if grow rights are okay. Well, why not let patients have that? And, yeah. you know, grow rights are, <laughs> grow rights are more of an idea than they are a, a reality for most people. I think, you know, most people aren't capable of growing anything of medical quality at all. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it does limit those patients as to what they can access and, and everything as well, too. Um, but it's about a two week turnaround from once they okay. send in their paperwork and everything right now. It used to be that renewing your card was the exact same process. Yeah. And for a long time, they were running 30 days up to six weeks for patients to get even a temporary card to go in and make their first purchase. Um, with COVID and everybody being at home. Yeah. They've, they've actually improved that process significantly. All renewals are going through within an hour. Patients are approved. So what was happening before, because they were waiting 30 to 60 days to approve the new patients, patients would expire. Like, let's just say I expire in 30 days. I would have to go get an approval today. But yeah. that my new license is from the date of certification by the doctor. So I would lose the next 30 days off of the second half of my, so you're paying for 11 ish months of, of, you know, a card before you have yeah. to renew. They've significantly improved that process for patients. So what is the cost? What's that? What is the cost for a card? Uh, it's a hundred dollars every year. Uh, renewals the same for that. Most of the doctor's offices are charging around 125 to $200 for the doctor's visit. If you can get it from your PCP that they can put it through as a regular office visit, then by all means, that's what we're recommending. But you're talking, you know, two fifty, three hundred dollars for patients just to come in and, and have that conversation of, is this something that's appropriate for me and, and what dosing and what products and how much is it going to cost and, and everything else. So it is, are patients afraid now are that now they're in the system? Cause you always hear this, you know, uh, that I don't want to be in the system. 
right. you know, and, um, you know, you get pulled over, um, you know, in the, in the officer and she's, Oh, Brian's a medical cannabis patient. Now I have a reason to, 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 to search or, you know, spent, you know, Chris and I spent a lot of time in Montana, you know, and a lot of them, you know, it, they're, they're hunters. That's a way of life, you know, mm -hmm. and a right to bear arms and they, they're cannabis patients, but they said, I can't, I, I can't do this because I'll lose my rights to, you know, uh, my hunting, you know, my guns. And yeah. so, you know, is, is because you're in the system, is that, is that show up in the DMV record now? I mean, that, that you have this or, um, it's so uh, police officers, when they pull you over, if yeah. you have cannabis in, you know, in your vehicle, you're allowed to have it in your vehicle as long as you're not consuming it. But it in has the trunk, to be, right? Just say, I, we always recommend put it in your trunk, yeah. you know, don't give them a reason to give you any trouble that you don't need. Yeah. Um, just like they can pull up their prescriptions to see if they have been receiving narcotics that might, that might be, have them under the influence. Okay. They can see that PMP that they, all they can see is that they have a medical marijuana card. Yes, they do have a legal medical marijuana card. They can't see what they've gotten, but they can see that they have one. Um, as long as they're not consuming, they're supposed to be left alone. Now, the, the two funny things there is uh, the majority of parole officers yeah. are now recommending that the parolees get a car just as a, a CYA. Wow. You know, just because they're like, listen, yeah, I don't yeah. want to violate you yeah. for doing something you're going to do when you can just go do this. And I mean, for anybody who's been in prison, there's a PTSD diagnosis just yeah. right there, you know, so... They're like, go get your card and I don't have to violate you. I don't want to send you back there for something. So you're seeing a lot of, a lot of the people that would be worried about being in the system yeah. are becoming much less concerned with being in the system because actually being in the system is benefiting them and causing them less headaches. Now it's a so double-edged uh, sword. I, oh, sorry. I was going to ask you earlier and, and, and I, I said, I'm not going to ask. And then we got into this and you're talking about this. I was going to ask you, um, can felons, uh, uh, obtain a card. Yes. And it sounds they can like obtain yes. a card. They just can't work in the industry. Okay. Messed up as yeah. that is. So, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. They, they can. So that's, that's not a problem. They're just not allowed to work for any cannabis company in the, in Connecticut, yeah. which is nuts. But so I, I feel bad because I, I want to, I, I wanted to have you talk about your business. So let's talk about your business. MM, uh, MM consult, the Connecticut. And so mm -hmm. can you share what your, what you do on a daily basis? Actually, that leads in perfect because that's exactly why I started my business was because okay. I had, um, you know, beyond the amount of questions I get from people just about CBD in general and everything too, I get so many people that would say, you know, oh, my mom wants to do this, but she just, she needs to talk to somebody before she's going to spend 300 bucks to do it. She doesn't know if it's right for her, this or that. Um, so many professional colleagues that were coming to me with questions, concerns, issues, that, you know, pharmacists that are seeing these prescriptions on their PMP and everything else, or sorry, certifications, medications on their PMP. Um, so I was getting so many questions and I, my particular situation, I was becoming a little disenfranchised with, we'll say. So I decided, I'm like, you know what, I am going to keep my pharmacist degree and what I've been doing intact and go and counsel patients consult for, you know, uh, doctor's offices, you know, psychiatric offices, anybody who wants in services or has questions, concerns, companies, how to deal with, you know, employees that are using their medication and, and you know, they still have to be within OSHA guidelines and everything else and how to deal with that. So that was where my company came from, was just the ability to get out there and talk to patients. You know, I was going out doing um, you know, festivals and stuff like that too, just setting up tables and saying, you know, we can talk about this, no problem. And so many patients were like, oh my God, I just, I don't want to go to a dispensary. I don't want to do this, but I want to know about that and tell me about CBD and tell me about this. And so it really was just kind of a natural progression for me. Um, in the process, I, I was asked to um, consult for the dispensary and then was just brought on there. And, you know, it just kind of fits. I'm able to see patients and, and help them there and, and continually do what I do and still keep my business running to do that on the side as well. So are you part owner in the dispensary or are you employed by the dispensary? How does that work? Um, just employed by the dispensary. That was kind of 
I had thought about, like, I kind of wanted that in the beginning, but then yeah. I also decided that I didn't want to be locked into any one particular situation. That can they, can they, can you work for a handful of dispensaries in your area as you being the pharmacy on staff? Like a lot of pharmacists um, do, a lot of pharmacists go from uh, pharmacy to pharmacy. Is that still the same type of uh, model that in, in this industry for you? Not exactly. Um, the, the state has each, each individual is registered to a specific dispensary. It's not the same as Walgreens where, you know, there's 120 in the state. And I think I worked at 80 of them throughout the, the time I was there. Um, it, they, they just, because of COVID actually started allowing us to be able to cover shifts for other dispensaries. If, okay. you know, if my owner calls your owner and they say, yeah, that's cool. No problem. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of individual ownership, they're worried about proprietary information, patient yeah. counts, probably, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it's really kind of like your brother, sister dispensaries that you might be working with something like that. If they really need a, you know, help covering, then we can do that. Um, but we do, we have an Academy of dispensaries that is through the Connecticut pharmacist association that was set up that we meet once a month. And we talk about a lot of like, you know, our pediatric patients, who's got who and how they're dosing stuff and whatnot as well. So we really try to bounce a lot of those type of ideas off of each other. You know, we're, this isn't available. What have you guys been doing for that? Or, you know, oh, hey, by the way, I checked this out and this worked. Um, you know, kind of like we're talking about with the new cannabinoids and everything yeah. too, you know, really being able to bounce those ideas around. But um, the, the, I would say the biggest thing my company has done for me is it gave me the time and the, the desire to dive in so much deeper, kind of like what we were saying at a patient's at a time, you go there and you're like, oh my God, where is all of this information all year round? I need more time to absorb it all and learn it all. Having my own business and running my own business, I was able to take the time to do that. At the dispensary, I'm working a job. I don't have all day to just dive into all the information, all the latest research and, and everything else that's going on, which is why those conferences can be so amazingly yeah. valuable. Um, but that was probably the biggest benefit is I gained so much knowledge and information. Um, and the biggest thing was that I know nothing because every time I think I know something, this industry changes on me. I, I learned go in another day. direction. I, mean, I learn every day. I mean, just on this, this, this uh, podcast, I've learned so much too. Um, you mentioned COVID, you know, and are you, are your dispensaries open? I mean, are you, how strict are you in bringing patients in? Um, I mean, how, how does that work right now? So um, we were still open. We were essential. Thank God. That was awesome. That was one of the first things that happened. We were, we were deemed essential, which is, I think, one of the biggest things for the industry in general is how many of us were deemed essential there and, and really that mindset changing about medical. Um, we were allowed to do curbside pickup. We're a brand new dispensary. We've, we just hit our one year anniversary. Gotcha. So we weren't so busy that we had 45 patients clamoring at the door every day to get in. So uh, we were able to maintain social distancing. We put up, you know, a bunch of plexiglass. We were cleaning five, six times a day before, after everything. Um, we were allowing patients that did have uh, significant chronic issues that were, you know, they were immunosuppressed for some reason to make an appointment early in the morning or before we, or after we close at night. So they're not around any other patients or anything either. Um, you know, we've had the majority of our patients are all doing pre-orders or calling orders in. So minimal contact in the store and everything too. Um, Connecticut doesn't allow deliveries or anything like that. That's definitely something we've been lobbying for. But, um, you know, the, the curbside really gave us a lot more freedom there to be able to help the patients outside and whatnot. Um, Connecticut was scary in the beginning. You know, I mean, we were all freaked out with, you know, everything from New York. Just It's just a matter of time before it bleeds into Connecticut because of, the amount of commuter people that work in, live in Connecticut and they like to say, they said they, they commute back and forth, back and forth to the city, you know? And Absolutely. So, you know, I mean, it, it hit us pretty quickly too. Um, fortunately it wasn't such a, a public issue. It was more like nursing homes and stuff that got yeah. hit hard in Connecticut. Um, so, you know, it wasn't as significant as it was for necessarily New York city or some of the towns closer to the city. Yeah. So we, I mean, and, I'll tell you, our business has done nothing but pick up, you know, not quite yeah. exponentially, but significantly so with the stress, the people are home, have the ability yeah, to medicate more, the, you know, they they lost their job. There's 
so many things going on that people are, are medicating more because of, um, you know, and just trying to deal with all of it. It's a new, definitely a new way of life. It's, uh, you know, I don't have to have kids. Um, uh, and I think you earlier said you did, you do, you have kids, don't you? Yep. Yeah. I have a daughter. Or, or, so how old is she? Uh, she's 11. So are you confident? Like I, I have this conversation with my friends all the time. I said, I don't know if I had kids, if I had sent them back to school and, and it's, it's split down the middle. The other ones are like, we, we want them out of here after, after homeschooling for so long. So um, are you confident? Um, I am. So my wife is a teacher. She's a okay. elementary school oh, wow. teacher. So, okay. I mean, we got it both ends there. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, I don't, I really would want to see the plan, I guess, as to what they're doing and how they're planning on doing it. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I feel yeah. like it, it was a disaster last year for these kids and for the teachers because nobody was, it wasn't possible for anybody to prepare in, yeah. in the slightest bit of appropriate way for any of it. So everybody was just struggling, teachers, kids, everything, it, you know, parents trying to keep their kid. like, you know, if you're an essential worker, where are my kids going to go every day? You know, and if I'm an essential worker, it means I'm exposed. I was an essential worker. So I am, you know, I mean, I basically quarantined in my basement every day for, you know, three, four months before things started to calm down around here. And, you know, so, I mean, that for me personally was a little difficult, but the kids going back to school, I think they need some social interaction. I think that helps a lot. Um, and, and I think I, I'm not the person to make that determination. Yeah, I think. Yeah. She wants to go back to school, but like, because my wife's a teacher and because we're fortunate enough to have only one kid, I know we can make sure she does what she needs to do to, to keep yeah. up. Yeah. I don't think most people have that, that luxury. And yeah. I completely respect the patients that are saying, we want our kids to go back to school because um, my wife as a teacher will be the first person to tell you that being able to, to teach a child and look in their eyes and see if they're understanding or not, to see if they have other issues going on or not, yeah. It is something that you can't do virtually. Uh, you know, like my wife wasn't even able to do any Zoom teaching or anything like that because they were actually concerned that something might happen in the background. There might be drug use, a gun, uh, oh, at the house, foul language at the at the kids, or even at our house, for instance, right? That you know, I mean, you've seen the videos of the dad walking in behind the the lady on Zoom in his underwear or something silly, you know. So they just, they were concerned that something happens that because teachers are forced to report to DCF oh. or whoever that now they have to, you know, and that's not something that is, is really relevant to what's going on, but because they saw it, they have to. So yeah. they decided we're not doing any Zoom at all. So these kids had zero face to face with their teachers or their, their fellow students or anything. I mean, that's huge for these kids that are second, third grade. It, it's a huge for everybody, you know, and I, and I do feel that a lot of people will be going through PTSD on this, you know? Oh um, yeah. I remember the first time my mom, you know, she's very healthy, knock on wood, you know, but I'm, I was her kind. Nope. I'm, I'm taking you to this store. I mean, I'll go to this store. I'll do this. Yeah. So she and right. I went for a walk and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, but about a week ago, we went to the store. She's, can I go? I said, let's go mom. Yeah, you know, she walked around like this. I said, "Don't touch anything." But she said, "This was really weird being out in public, you know." But uh, anyway, um, anyway, new lay, new way of life. And Brian, I, I, I yeah. you know, before we go, do you have any? Um, I want you to. Uh, how can people find you? One, and uh, and 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 I love it that you're hand holding because that's one thing that Chris and I prided ourselves on. We're still pride ourselves on is is hand holding, being that uh, you know helping. Patients avoid the tangled web in this industry. You know, when you've been diagnosed with something as severe as cancer and you only have a short amount of time, you don't want them to go down the wrong street, hit a roadblock and turn back and go, God, I just wasted six, seven days right. out of the 14 days that I was given. And so we're able to, sounds like you do the same thing. These are the questions to ask. These are the questions, the places to avoid. This is the type that, that, that's safe. Um, you know, and so it sounds like you do the same. So how can people get a hold of you one? Uh, and then if you want to, I mean, I love, let's talk about how you get a hold of you, name of your dispensary, and then any closing words for our group, for our followers. Yeah. 
absolutely. Uh, my website's just uh, mmconsultct.com. Okay. Um, you can email me. It's uh, Brian at, er, sorry, B period Essenter, E S S E N T E R at gmail.com um, is right where you can get me, or you can email info at mmconsultct.com. Um, and, you know, any one of those, I'm happy to, to help anybody with anything they need, whether it's dosing, strain related, you know, delivery method, whatever it happens to be. Um, final words, just, uh, you know, make sure that you, you do your own research. Don't just listen to anybody because they think they happen to know something. And, and try to make sure that you know the research, the websites that you're going are legitimate resources. Um, you know, don't just Google cannabis and, and think you're going to get some accurate information. Um, you know, and, and if you don't believe you're getting accurate information, please feel free to reach out. I mean, you know, we have patients contacting us at the dispensary just because they want to know more and, and everything too. They're not a patient, but they have questions. And, you know, so I'm happy to provide certain websites and stuff, but my website has a lot of resources on there, especially for Connecticut patients that I know are valid, legitimate websites. Um, I know that the United Patients Group has awesome resources as well for patients too. And, and I think to make sure that we go to those places that have good resources uh, is as important as anything because you, know, you, you can Google it and any you know, soccer mom that's out there can write a blog about cannabis and what it does or hasn't done. And you know, just, because, just like in the pharmacy, you know, they come to the counter and they say, you know, oh, well, I have a cough, you know, and, and I have high blood pressure. And, you know, my cousin's uncle said that I need, you know, this medication. And, and we sit there and we're like, well, actually, you have high blood pressure, you know, and, and you're a diabetic. We didn't even mention that. You really need to try this cough medication. And you watch them walk over to the shelf and they grab whatever their cousin's uncle told them to grab because they, they happen to trust them more. Well, in this industry, it's so easy to, you know, say, oh, well, I have back pain too, and this worked for me. And well, I mean, I've heard, you know, 22 year old kids trying to tell a 75 year old grandmother she needs to dab because that's going to help her back wow. pain. You know, so just be careful where you get your information from. Try to find valuable resources, um, you know, and I I'm always happy to answer any questions so that patients get some, some more benefit and not the side effects and everything else that we don't want. Thank you. It, you I mean, that's a whole, <clears throat> you just hit three more topics that we could have continued on. <laughs> right. Dabbing more is not better. It's not a right. website fits all. What works for me doesn't work, may not work for you. Um, you know, and so these are all things that uh, just like, you know, I, I always share, share, this is what I used to share with the pharmacist uh, is, your doctor is going to put on the pharmacy, take one pill every eight hours, not eight pills every one hour. And the right. same thing with cannabis, you know, more is not right. better. And so, you know, going on to see, you know, soccer mom Susie online saying, take a gram a day. I'm not a fan of gram a day. You know, uh, right. you know, I think less is more. Uh, everyone's different. And, and uh, so anyway, Brian, and uh, so mmconsultct.com. Yep. I pronounce your name a center, but you're saying Essenter? Same. I've been called so many different things. Yes, yeah, same. Well, uh, my last name is Malanka, and, I, and, and people go Malanka. I'm like, no, Malanka. So what is, sure. the, what is the correct pronunciation? Essenter. Essenter. So yep. Brian Essenter. Yes. Thank you so much. I really no appreciate problem. you Thank coming you, on. I, I, really, I actually, I really enjoyed this, this podcast. And so I uh, uh, look forward to one day seeing you again and giving you a hug and, or a handshake if that even exists in this life anymore. So, but uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Be safe. And again, I thank you. Thanks again for your time. Um, this is John Malanka with the United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.